Uh, my name is Tristan Zients, uh, I, and I think you got a little bit of an intro for me earlier today, um, but it's, it's uh, a pleasure being with everybody here today. Um, and uh, I wanted, uh, I'm currently co-founder of a startup called Continue. I'll give you a little bit more of my background uh, in a second. Um, but today I want to basically talk about um, the case for declarative machine learning, which is basically uh, a, a new approach to doing machine learning, to doing operational machine learning, uh, and sort of make a case that uh, if we think about it over the next couple of years, how uh, machine learning and production is going, going to unfold, it should borrow some of the ideas in this, uh, this paper. So maybe before I just get started, since we're a small group here, um, who here has worked on machine learning problems? I know that a lot of you are all data engineers working with data. Maybe some of that data is feeding machine learning. Uh, you know, can I get a raise of hands for like who's worked on a production machine learning model? Or are we a, a crowd that maybe hasn't made that uh, jump yet? Nobody. All right. Awesome. Who who thinks there may be uses for machine learning in their in their company? A couple people. Okay. A couple people. Um, so so this might be a little bit uh, you know the some of the background here might be new to you, but hopefully it will give you uh, an appreciation for what the current state of the art is for uh, machine learning today, what it looks like today, what what machine learning operations looks like today, uh, and a little bit of a hint, a conceptual hint on where it might go uh, in, in in the future. Um, I'll talk kind of high level about uh, the, the state of the art for uh, machine learning operations. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing at Continual um, and you know, how we're trying to simplify uh, some, of the, some of the status quo. So before jumping into doing that, um, who, who am I? Um, if you were heavily involved in data science and the ML ecosystem, uh, which it sounds like folks here are not, uh, some of you may know me from uh, an early startup that I did in the 2000, sort of 15, 16 timeframe called Sense. I was one of the first enterprise data science uh, platform companies. Uh, ended up getting acquired by uh, Cloudera. Uh, if you're working in the big data or Hadoop ecosystem, you, know, may, you may know uh, Cloudera as sort of the leading provider of, of, of Hadoop. Um, so that uh, first startup that I built was acquired by Cloudera. I then led the machine learning platform team there. If you've used Cloudera's products, they have a product now called Cloudera Machine Learning, that's, uh, or Cloudera Data Science Workbench. That's the product that I built at the startup, and then they kind of they rebranded. So, have been working on machine learning infrastructure both at startups and at large companies for for a number of years. Um, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, you know, two and a half years, I've been working uh, on a startup called Continual, which is also in the machine learning uh, operations space, but taking a very different approach, approach that sort of embraces some of the ideas that are similar to what how Streamsets is trying to uh, think about data ops uh, and apply some of the similar ideas as you'll see. Uh, to production machine learning. Um, so I'm also a little bit of a hypocrite. Um, so this is a, this is a, and I just want to uh, preface this up front. So this is a, uh, this is a talk that I gave in 2018. And some of you, you know, maybe if you're just working on infrastructure, you know, go to KubeCon and have, you know, been involved in the whole kind of containerization and cloud native trends. Uh, and so in, in 2018, I, I gave a talk, you know, which was basically enterprise machine learning on Kubernetes. And as you'll see, this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it was basically saying lessons learned and the road ahead. And it was all about you know, the need to containerize machine learning pipelines and you know, bring them into this sort of cloud native era. Um, and I think that uh, you know, was very uh, a sort of a good theme for 2018. But we're now a couple years into the future, four years into the future. Uh, and I think that's you know, just putting things into containers, putting things onto top of Kubernetes. Uh, I would say it's sort of boring from, a, from, a, from a, a machine learning operations perspective. I think we can do much better than that. We can simplify the maintenance uh, and the operational aspects of machine learning uh, in a much more dramatic way, um, uh, as, I'll, as I'll discuss. So what is the current state of machine learning operations? Most people I talk to feel this acutely. Um, you may not feel it as acutely uh, if you're not kind of in the weeds here of machine learning operations. But the, the core, if you're, if, you're, if you're doing this every day, I think you would pretty much get universal agreement by practitioners that machine learning uh, operations, or ML ops, is drowning in complexity. And what do I, why is that the case? And one, thing I, one, one way I like to, uh, to think about why this is the case is that we've spent the last five years uh, copying Uber. And so, if, again, if you were very familiar with the machine learning operations space, you, there was a blog post, uh, I think in the 2000, sort of 16, 17 or, uh, you know, era from Uber describing their internal machine learning platform, which was called uh, uh, Uber Michelangelo. And this was a, a sort of a famous um, picture from, from that, uh, 
that stack that they were describing. And so what Uber was describing, um, you know, you may think of it as a, a car, you know, s service that can kind of show up if you, uh, at the point at the click of a, a button on your phone. But at the core of Uber is a bunch of machine learning models that are powering uh, features inside of their product, right? One of the most important ones, although it's one of uh, many, um, is this, let's see if this works. Oh, I gotta turn this on. Oh no, let's see, I can point here. I don't have this on, so that's, oh, I gotta go like this. Let me just do this so I can point here a little bit, if I can. So the, uh, the, one of the core predictions that they need to make, which you need uh, machine learning for, is the prediction of their arrival time. And so this is essentially what the, some product manager says, hey, wouldn't it be great to see you know, a real-time uh, update of when the car is going to arrive, right? Um, maybe both before you order it, and then of course once it, the, the, the car has actually been routed, uh, the actual arrival time uh, uh, for that particular car. You can of course imagine that there's other machine learning models going on in the background, like for instance on the routing decision, what car is the best car to, for, to, for, for, the, for, the, for this particular user. Um, that could also involve a number of machine learning models. And so what they decided to, what they described is how basically they were building a model to predict arrival. So this seems like conceptually, right, a very simple product ask. You're gonna say in your, in your individual application, you want a time, you want that time to be maybe updated every minute that says, okay, uh, what is my current best estimate for the arrival time? What the engineering team decided to build was this, okay? And the key thing to recognize here is to look at each of these individual uh, components separately. So the first thing is there's a split between an offline environment here. An offline environment is used for training, and I'll walk through this a little bit in, in more depth, depth. And then an online environment here. The online environment is recognizing that, hey, this prediction is a real-time prediction. It depends on where the car is, where the user is, what the current traffic uh, conditions are. So it depends on a lot of uh, real-time data. The, that gives you your real-time prediction over here. So like your application is, is basically right here. Um, and this offline environment is the training infrastructure and the monitoring infrastructure. So you want to basically train a model, a predictive model, uh, to give you arrival time. That's an offline sort of batch process, and here's the infrastructure that you want. Okay, so let's look a little bit at what is required from an engineering perspective. You know, in this, well, honestly, this is roughly, as I'll describe, the current state of the art still. Um, what is required to deliver something simple like this? So let's go into the, the online component first. Well, first of all, you have Kafka, right? So you have a distributed system. This little box here is a distributed system called Kafka. You have a stream engine right here. So this well, could be stream sets, but let's like, like, keep it in this era of product, right? This is probably like Spark Streaming or Flink or something like that. So that's a second distributed system. So we have two distributed systems. Then we have uh, what they call a, a Cassandra, which is a, right, a distributed uh, key value, sort of a fast row lookup in, in environment. Um, and that's a feature store. So what is that used for? It's saying, okay, where is every single car? Where is the user? What is the traffic conditions? We need to, at incredible low latency, be able to look that information up to be able to feed it into the model. So that's a feature. A feature is an input to a predictive model. That might be the location uh, of a... Um, uh, of a particular car, right? So you have the GPS locations of your car coming in here, they're being transformed, they're going into a real-time feature store. You now have three distributed systems uh, right here. Over here, you have your real-time predictions you know, service, okay? So what is, uh, if you're thinking about a real-time prediction service, that's where your model is gonna be inside of that. Well, you know, in today's era, that's probably some sort of cloud, like cloud native thing. Maybe it's on Kubernetes. It's probably a container. You probably Dockerized it, right, to manage your complex machine learning dependencies. So here you have Kubernetes, right? Um, you might, if you're in the cloud world, have AWS Lambda or some, some other service endpoint. But again, another distributed system to, to manage. And then you have your client over here. All of that is doing is it's saying real-time data in, real-time feature generation, right? Uh, real-time uh, feature storage, real-time uh, uh, predictive inference, and then real-time uh, client access from it, okay? And you've got four distributed systems inside this, this top-level online box, okay? Well, the bottom box looks even more complicated. So, and there's coordination actually, you know, tragically between these two layers. So here is the environment. This is an environment to do inference, right? That is to compute a prediction uh, given the latest information that you know about a customer. Well, you also need to train a model. And to tra training a model is simply saying, looking at the historical data, right? If I look at where cars were and if I look at when cars arrived, right? The ground truth is when cars actually arrived. The historical data is, for instance, where they were, the GPS location of the individual versus the, the other person, plus all of the historical traffic information and all the historical features. 
right? You need to track all of that historical data, right? Not just the current data, but all of the historical data that you had in the past so that you can train a predictive model. So Uber describes how they do that in this, in this world. Here they have a data lake. Well, okay, that's like Cloudera and Hadoop, right? That's in and of itself, if I'm, you know, it's like 33 distributed systems right there if you're in the Hadoop world. Um, but that's basically, okay, we want, we want some sort of large scale, maybe it's a lake house now in the, in the, in the, in the, in the more modern era, you know, sitting on top of S3, but it's still a kind of a distributed system. We then have sort of a data preparation job, basically an offline feature generation. So in the online environment, we have Kafka streams, we're generating real-time features, where's the car currently? In the offline world, we need to say, okay, for this individual on a five minute basis or on a minute basis, where was that person? What is the track of that person? And then you're gonna featureize it, right? You're gonna bin the, the, the traffic by like, you know, a hexagonal shape and do all this crazy stuff. And okay, here they're using Spark or Spark Spark or maybe Hive SQL or something like that. You have the Hive, Meta, Hive feature store, which is an offline equivalent to that. So it's like a sort of a SQL, you know, a catalog of your features for the historical training purposes. It's kind of replicating some of the Cassandra stuff from a real time basis. Um, and you have a whole bunch of other systems here. I, these fonts are a little sm small, but you're looking at your outcomes. So that's your ground truth. You're looking at your batch training system. So that's probably again, a containerized system. There's probably GPUs inside of there. You've got a model registry where you're storing the models. You've got uh, a batch uh, inference service for, for the batch use cases that you're doing where you're actually just trying to update static predictions. For instance, like the, uh, the traffic patterns on, uh, on a particular geolocation generally over time. So you can forecast things. And then you, of course, have the whole observability problem of, okay, now you've deployed all these models. You need some way to say, are they doing any good? So you have a whole monitor. This is probably a box that actually entails multiple components. All right. So if you look at this, you know, I, I dwell on this uh, slide, you know, slide a little bit, you know, a, a long time just to, you know, illustrate that this stack makes complete logical sense for doing production machine learning, right? So if you're looking to do production machine learning today, your MLOps engineers will probably look, read this blog and read similar blogs from other uh, tech companies and say, okay, we need to build something like that. And you say, well, what component can I remove? Not really any component. You need all these. You need streaming data, streaming feature generation, streaming real-time feature stores, prediction service, you need an offline training environment, you need historical data, you need monitoring, you need uh, training, you need a model registry for model versioning, you need a batch prediction to service and real-time prediction. So all of these components are uh, required, but wow, I mean, you've just got I mean, generally, you know, even if I'm conservative, five, six different distributed systems here, data systems in here, and you need people to maintain those systems, you need people to know how to use those systems, uh, and you need people to do some kind of wild dance actually between these offline and online worlds because you need consistency of features across these different environments. There's lots of little, you know, very hard actually engineering challenges, even if you have stood up a stack like this. So how do you reliably and repeatedly deliver predict predictive models on top of the stack? which is the purpose of building a stack like this, right? And streamlining your ML ops. Well, it's really, really hard. So what is the solution? You might think, oh, Tristan, you are telling me, uh, you know, you're operating in this old school Hadoop world, right? You're an ex cloud era person. And you're telling me that I need to build all this stuff. We're now in the cloud world, right? So all I need to do is move to AWS or Google or something like that. And then I'll be totally set. So you might do something the similar, right, but in the cloud world. So here's a, here's a stack diagram from AWS. And if you kind of did, the, I could do the exact same thing that I just did previously. Well, the one benefit here is a lot of these services are managed, okay? So all of those individual boxes, they're now managed services. So maybe you've lowered your platform you know, team. That team is now just you know, manipulating, I don't know, Terraform files or something like that to manage this infrastructure. But the nitty gritty of it uh, might be mostly managed, although I mean, you've probably managed enough cloud infrastructure to realize that's not always the case you still are left with an incredible coordination and workflow challenge between actually setting up a kind of comprehensive stack. This is uh, the production machine learning stack recommended um, by, uh, by AWS. And you know, you're seeing here the kind of the whole workflow that they're doing, version control, how do you get those things into the, into the various uh, systems. Um, you know, I don't even know if you, if you stare at here, do they even have real time features in here? I don't know, they might not, right? This might be some sort of batch stack that they have to stare at these individual uh, boxes a lot. So still, cloud probably definitely makes things easier, certainly better than managing a bunch of Hadoop stuff and on-prem, on, on but um, uh, still pretty, pretty, pretty difficult. So the next thing you could say is, well, okay, I know, you know, I know the cloud is great. It's like one vendor, you know, one, one, one contract, you know, kind of sort of integrated. 
But I also know that you know it's all by these you know sort of small pizza one pizza one pizza teams to use Amazon's terminology that they don't build really best of breed products, great developer experiences, right? You know I can build go to you know startups um, and 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 kind of get best best of breed developer experiences. So you might decide, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out into the ecosystem and build some, uh, look at the ecosystem in terms of the startup ecosystem where there are some great products, right? You might say, oh, I want to use Snowflake for my data warehouse. I might want to use stream sets for my uh, data processing. I might want to use, there's other tools more in the MLOps ecosystem like weights and biases for experiment tracking, model serving, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see it's a relatively wild game too because there's just a ton. These are all vendors in the, in the MLOps ecosystem. And to stitch this all into a coherent production grade um, flow is going to be challenging. So what's the, what's the net result? What's the end result of all this? The end result is basically three challenges. So one is a set of infrastructure challenges where you have AI infrastructure that is complicated, uh, uh, complex, expensive, and siloed from, from the data and analytics stack that you, or the, the rest of the data infrastructure that you have. You basically built this parallel ecosystem right here that's completely um, that's completely specific to your to your ML op, op, op stack, um, or comp maybe you have a few shared components, right? Your data lake's shared, but this whole the way this whole thing is orchestrated is governed. This is all managed by a ML platform team um, and is relatively solid. For instance, from maybe the, the the BI use cases that you're doing. The second thing that, you're, that you, 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 you have is you have team challenges. So in, in this context, you know, it sounds like we have a lot of maybe more data engineers or uh, people that are, are, are just moving data around um, using tools like stream sets. And you might not be the person who's you know, relentlessly following this MLOps ecosystem, has figured out how to manage all of this uh, infrastructure, has then all, not only figured out how to manage all this infrastructure, but actually also knows how to do the ML. Right? I haven't even talked that inside this little box where we're training a model or inside this box where we're doing inference, right, there's tremendous complexity. Right? You're doing maybe deep neural nets, um, all, this, all this sort of stuff. So in order, with this sort of traditional way we're doing uh, machine learning operations, Every new use case requires a significant time investment from a highly skilled team. You might even have the highly skilled team, right? But the time investment, if you really think about infusing AI and ML across your business, which is a lot of the aspirational goal of a lot of companies, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be time consuming to do that. And finally, I would say an understated uh, reality um, is the operational challenges. So there's simply, a lot of people sort of think, oh, you know, once I get a model into production, that's the end of the day. But models are these living and breathing things, right? The world is fundamentally changing, right? COVID hits, data changes. The models need to be, I mean, in some cases, like for instance, in fraud or spam, you have adversarial actors. So in fact, the world is changing very fast. As soon as you deploy a model, as soon as Google deploys models for search re-ranking, all the content generators are all there trying to figure out how to exploit that. You know, same thing with, you know, uh, you know like abuse prevention, fraud, um, the, you have these very adversarial actors who are rapidly uh, trying to exploit the weaknesses of your predictive model. And so what you really ultimately need is a closed loop system that's, that, that where you're looking for the flaws of your models, where they're not performing well, and you're improving that, right? And sometimes that means automated retraining. Sometimes it means a flywheel back to it where you, you need a human in the loop, right? And you need to be able to quickly iterate on a feature, add a feature to your model, deploy it, then maintain it, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, there's a tremendous sort of day two complexity. Right? Then, of course, what ultimately happens also is you lose your team member who built, set this whole thing up, and you need to onboard a new team member. Right? And so that you know, is, a, is another challenge, which I would say I hear a ton of. Um, and you probably see this, you know, the same thing within data engineering, where maybe you set up a sort of a, a nice, or maybe one of your leads thinks what they've set up is a very nice system, but that lead then leaves for another company or another opportunity. Somebody else comes in and they have no idea what this particular person does. The state of the art has changed. They don't think what the other person did was great. They try to rewrite it. You know, you kind of get into this uh, sort of uh, highly unproductive um, sort of uh, regime, if you will. Okay, so, you know, the final thing is it's just less fun. So, um, I mean, ML, I think, is one of the sort of more, very interesting and fascinating technical domain. It's, you know, particularly with what's going on right now. Um, and this stuff, once, you know, it's fun the first time you do it. The second time you do it, it's, okay, well, now at least I know how to do it. The third time you do it, it's, it gets, hey, this is tiresome. I want to find a better way uh, to ultimately do this. And I think that's where we uh, are today, where people are looking for uh, a better way. So... Is there another way, right? Is this inherent complexity? I think there's always a question in technology. Are, is this an inherent compli complicated domain that cannot be fundamentally simplified, right? That could happen. 
Um, or is there something that we can do that maybe is a little bit different that's, um, you know, that's borrowing on ideas from other places or uh, you know, takes inspiration maybe from other areas uh, that actually doesn't lead, that doesn't lead to these problems? So I want to argue um, that we've seen this sort of problem, this sort of complexity overload problem before, and we fixed it in other regimes. Okay? And we can borrow some of the ideas that we've used in other regimes um, uh, to, uh, and apply them to, to machine learning. So let me just give you three examples. So one is infrastructure. So in the world of infrastructure, we maybe you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you know, we used shell scripts, right? You wanted to provision some, a cloud VM, you wanted to provision a database. Um, what did you do? Well, the first time you probably just did it manually. Then you were like, well, I need to automate this a little bit. So you wrote some shell scripts because that was your tool of choice. Maybe you wrote some Python scripts if you were a Python person or Perl if you were back in, the, back in, that, back in, that, in, in those days. But we quickly realized, hey, this is kind of an unsustainable mess, right? This leads to a, you know, a kind of a, a sort of a jungle of these, you know, provisioning pipelines and maintenance scripts and, you know, redeployment scripts and all of this sort of stuff. So we looked for higher level tools. We took an intermediate step where we adopted tools like Ansible for some of those few people that were familiar with those, which are saying, hey, let's have a higher level abstraction in that case, in Ansible's case, an idempotent abstraction. I can run the same script again and again. Let me try to run a script again and again. Let me sort of you know, only execute the things that seem to need to be executed, um, sort of to put it into a YAML file of some sort, which if you're familiar with Ansible, that's how it works. Uh, and then I'll just kind of run Ansible, run Ansible, run, and then my infrastructure will probably end up in the place that I want it to be, at least in a more reliable way. More recently, right, over the last five, five years or so, I would say there's a tremendous shift towards tools like Terraform. Tools like Pulumi is another one like this. Terraform is a declarative infrastructure management system. And it's what it says is, hey, let's describe the infrastructure that we want, right? Let's say I want three VMs. I want them on this version of the VM, right? I want it, how many, this many CPUs, this much memory. I want it attached to this VPC, this ENI, whatever you want, right, if you're a cloud infrastructure person. Right, how to set up my VPC like this, have my load balancer like that, connected to this endpoint, but not, hey, let me go and provision that. Let me just describe, let me write, create a, a, a description of that. Right? In, in Terraform, you do that with uh, sort of Terraform's configuration language, but you could imagine doing that visually as well. You describe what you want, and then the system, yes, behind the scenes, there's crazy pipelines happening, things are happening, there's reconciliation loops going on. What is the current state of the system? What is the, what is the desired state? Let me try to go and figure out a plan to, to move the current state of the world to the desired state of the world, right? In Terraform's world, you kind of do that once or you put it on a cron and it kind of reconciles. In the world of Kubernetes, which is also a declarative uh, infrastructure system applied to containers, you have a very similar concept, right? You declaratively define what your infrastructure is in YAML files in the, in the case of Kubernetes. And then Kubernetes has an idea of reconciliation. Again, a declarative high level of abstraction in terms of what you want, right? Behind the scenes, yes, of course, in the end of the day, you have to say create a VM or create a container, delete the container, restart the container, all that stuff. But the end user doesn't have to do that, right? So raise the higher level of abstraction, simplify the way you work, and also I would say a third benefit is really standardize the way you operate, right? So that a whole team, once you become familiar with Terraform, you join a new company, oh man, they have crazy infrastructure, right? But hey, you just look at that Terraform configuration file and you kind of say, okay, I understand the infrastructure, right? I need to change or increase the size of a VM. No problem, I just change it here, boom. And you feel like it's you know, reviewable, you can check it into version control, you can review it, uh, you can deploy it, govern it, et cetera. And so that person leaves the company, somebody else joins, and it's a shared set of skills we have. So if you're an infrastructure person, this kind of might resonate with you. If you're a data person, right, um, I come, you know, or think about analytics, I come, or big data analytics in particular, I come from the world, right, of Hadoop. So in Hadoop, we face a challenge where, hey, we were generating massive quantities of data, traditional analytical systems couldn't handle it, right, and we needed a way to process massive amounts of data. And so Google said, hey, we did, we, what we're doing internally is something called MapReduce. This is, right, the, gen, the origin of this whole, the whole world. Um, and uh, which is a, you know, a programmatic uh, uh, sort of abstraction. Um, and if you wanted to do an analytical query in this era, right, in the early eras of the Hadoop ecosystem, right, you basically would write Java MapReduce programs, okay? Um, and all the complexity of joins and filters and all this stuff would be kind of left to you, right? I.O., et cetera. Over the last few years, right, 
we, we maybe we obviously had SQL back here, and then we kind of fell. The idea was that hey, it fell over a little bit, and then we, you know, we, when it came to scale. But over the last few years, there's been an overwhelming shift, right, with the rise of cloud data, cloud data warehouses, cloud data platforms toward toward SQL. Even in the Hadoop ecosystem, right, with the, we quickly saw a move towards more uh, more SQL-oriented approaches. Things like Hive, Spark SQL, right. Then there's a whole bunch of other ones like Impala, and now most recently the rise of cloud data warehouses, things like BigQuery, Snowflake, et cetera, which are saying, oh, don't even worry about, you know, not only can you describe things in a high level declarative language called SQL, right? But we're not also gonna take care of the infrastructure. But what's going on here? I mean, what is SQL? Just to be, just to be explicit about this, SQL is a high level declarative abstraction that describes data transformation and analytical queries, right? You're not thinking imperatively about how joins actually happening. Behind this, what happens is you have a, a declarative uh, language, in this case, SQL, right? In the previous case, it was Terraform, uh, you know, con configuration language, that describes what you want to do, what data you want to filter, what data you want to join, on what keys do you want to join it. Then that, a system, your query executor, right, parses that, well, it parses that, and then it goes into an execution, you know, graph, and it figures out how to convert that into a plan, and a physical plan, logical plan, all this sort of stuff. All that stuff you don't have to worry about as the end user, right? You just have to worry about, hey, what is the analytical question that I want to ask? Let me describe it. Let me go, let me go this system, let's figure it out. And these systems have gotten in, insanely powerful, right? Uh, to the degree that you can't even hand, hand write the type of code that, that, that these systems generate, right? They're doing all this vectorization, all this wild stuff, um, you know, cost-based optimizers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So again, move from a low-level abstraction, right? We started in a world where in order to do the powerful data work that we wanted to do, we needed a low-level abstraction. Time went on, we found higher-level abstractions, or in the case of SQL, kind of re-found higher-level abstractions. Um, and said, hey, we can actually do SQL at scale. It's not intractable. Uh, and so let's do that because it's, it's simpler uh, for us to do. We're more productive. And again, that third benefit of, hey, my team is on one sort of mode of operating where you can onboard and offboard team members quickly uh, and you can all work sort of with a shared, um, uh, sort of a shared set of tools and a shared set of knowledge, right? In a, in a world that even with SQL is pretty complicated, right? I mean, you still have to be you know, pretty, pretty talented to, to, to like do write a lot of these SQL queries that are in the real world. So I could give other examples of this. This has happened in, you know, I used to, I sometimes give an example, for instance, like UI frameworks. If you're a front-end developer, you know, you have this world where we went from jQuery to React. It's a similar thing where you went from imperative to declarative. We describe our UIs. Um, in the case of just data ops generally, right, not analytics, you have things like, you know, to plug stream sets here, we went from a world where we might have, in a previous world, managed all of our ETL and data ops process using a bunch of Python scripts, using a bunch of uh, Scala scripts, right? It makes, it's fine, right? It makes sense. I mean, Airflow, you, you do that, right? You can do it all bespoke, fine, you can do that. It's not like it doesn't, doesn't you know, work, but it leads to a lot of that uh, increase in complexity, particularly as your organization scales, as you onboard and offboard team members. Um, what once was maybe a productive way to do things starts to slow down, starts to become harder and harder. Um, you know, infrastructure becomes harder, team challenges become harder, operational challenges become harder. And so tool, there, there then is this emergence of tools like stream sets, which try to raise the level of abstraction, right? Give you a thing where you can describe essentially what your pipelines look like, and then have those, the resiliency of those pipelines be uh, as much as possible be taken care of for you, right? So if, hey, if there's an error, have it, be, have it retry, right? That sort, of, that sort of thing. If there's an error, certainly sh show it to you. Um, so the, 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 what is the, what is the, uh, what are kind of the, the higher level lesson from, from all of these things? So it seems like when facing complexity, particularly in these sort of data and analytical domains, there's this general solution which has been to find higher level, often I would say declarative, to use kind of a more technical term, abstractions. Okay, Where, and by declarative I mean basically describe what you're trying to do, not how you get there, right? Um, can blend a little bit in some cases, but, but, but uh, generally a high level standardized interface where you describe what you want. Uh, and then the system may be doing a lot of crazy complicated stuff behind the scenes, but you as the end user don't have to worry about that, right? So the question is, can we do, or the question that I've been thinking about um, over the last couple of years, and I think, the, there, I think it's a question in terms of like, as we take these ideas of uh, moving data and analytics towards a more declarative and higher level abstraction, 
I think one final step here is machine learning and artificial intelligence, right? If you think of the value pyramid, you know, you store your data, you do some data engineering, you do some analytics, but then you do predictive analytics, kind of AI, ML, whatever you want to call it. And so the, I, the question is, is there some similar kind of concept that we can apply to machine learning? And actually, not just machine learning itself, but I would, I would argue that it, it's really operate, it's both of these words. It's both AI itself, okay, what, what you're trying to do, what are you trying to predict, but then it's, you can't overlook the, the operational bit, right? The reality that you're wor living in a world with it, where the AI needs dynamic data, the AI needs to be updated, uh, there's lots of, the AI needs to be monitored, right? There's lots of operational concerns. If you just kind of make a declarative abstraction, simplified no-code abstraction to AI, eh, ultimately it's not gonna have that much value in real business use cases. You're ultimately gonna really need an operational system that is uh, also uh, supporting machine learning or, or, or AI. So uh, let's think about that. So how do you think about what, what is, op I think in order to, what is, is there an abstraction you have to think, what is operational AI? So I think it's actually, you can just break it into those, well, first of all, what is it? Is an empirical reality, it's bespoke pipelines, okay? That's what, the, the, that's what the current state of the world is. If you look at any machine learning system today at a, at a production kind of company, what you're gonna see is a ton of pipelines running on top of Airflow, Dagster, Prefect, uh, maybe even some st stream sets, but probably they haven't even got to that stage. Honestly, it's probably a bunch of you know infrastructure. It's basically that Uber stack, whether it's in the cloud, or on Google, on Microsoft, on, on Hadoop, on whatever, it's some version of that, uh, that Uber stack uh, that I described. Okay, and gluing it all together, there's a bunch of infrastructure coming on, gluing it all together are these sort of pipelines that people are authoring by hand uh, that do everything from data ingest to data feature engineering or data processing, feature engineering, machine learning training, machine learning inference, et cetera, monitoring, et cetera. So that's the empirical reality, but that's obviously not, we don't want just, I don't think we want, the, the abstraction that's right here, I don't think is just pipelines, or certainly not bespoke pipelines. Bespoke, I just mean like kind of handwritten, very one-off type, type things. I think, it, in fact, the, the way to think about ML is to decompose it into two parts. The first part is that AI part, the ML part. And you could call this the, they call this the model. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna use the term model here just because it's, it's uh, overloaded with SQL models and people from different backgrounds have different terms. So one way to think about this is the ML task. That's right, I'm trying to predict the arrival time, okay? So that's, what, that's the ML task. So first of all, the, the question that you guys ask, of all the different types of predictions that I wanna make, is there a high level of abstraction that I can think about these things? Or is it the case that I need to be, you know, get my stats PhD and every single one I'm sitting there, you know, typing out my neural net, right, in PyTorch or TensorFlow, and that's the only way it's, it's gonna go. And I would say the answer to this is, um, overwhelmingly, over the last few years, there's been a convergence, at least conceptually, about the way to think about machine learning. Uh, and actually, even ultimately the architecture, although that's, not, that's less important because you can kind of mix and match the architecture as you want. So this is a, this is a, 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 plot, a, a diagram that's kind of inspired by this, 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 uh, this project called Ludwig, which is a code-free deep learning tool, toolbox. You know, it's, it's open source on, on GitHub. It's, a super, it's actually from Uber. It's from Uber's research AI group. Um, it's a super cool uh, project. Um, and the, the main insight here is, let's, what is machine learning? Machine learning is nothing more than a function, okay, that takes inputs and maps them to outputs. Okay, it's, it's literally nothing more than a transformation. You take some inputs, you could call those features or it's more generically inputs, and you map them to outputs which you could call predictions, okay? This function here, unlike traditional computer science functions or programming functions where you might be writing a function that says if then this, you know, if this input then do this, else this, this function has a bunch of knobs inside of it, a bunch of parameters that are learned, that the systems during training process are learned. How do you learn? How do you train a predictive model? All you do is you set the knobs at one level. You pass the inputs through this. So the inputs X through this plus some knobs. I didn't put them here, but you put, put it through there. And you generate some predicted outputs. And then you see how far were those predicted outputs from the actual outputs that I observed. And then you say, oh, let me move my knobs, move my parameters towards a value that minimizes the distance between my predictions and my observations. Okay, that's called, sometimes called gradient descent because um, you're kind of going down, you're saying there's a loss which is like the, the difference between your observations and your predictions and you're going to go, 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 go down. And so the training process is really, there's all, sorts of, there's all sorts of methods to go down and try to find good settings for your knobs. 
Uh, and there's all sorts of also ways to have knobs. You have a lot of knobs. Are your knobs in a linear function? Are they like a deep neural net? That's the architecture, right? But conceptually, what you have is you have a function with a bunch of knobs. We have a training process that, that, that tunes these things between them. And that's really all that machine learning is. Now, you might say, OK, wait, Tristan, like that's, you know, you're, you're kind of oversimplifying. You know, I'm aware of other things like, you know, like, like reinforcement learning. Like if you're going to drive a car, that can't be that what you're doing. Or if you're going to, you know, un, un, you know under summarize an image or, or a piece of text, that can't be what you're doing. But that is actually what you're doing. So just to, just to show you, that what this is saying is here's a bunch of different types that are inputs and here's a bunch of different types that are outputs. And so think of some common use cases that you might have. So a very common one would be regression, which is saying what you basically want to predict something like arrival time, a continuous variable, using some features that are often like things like categorical variables uh, you know, or you know, numbers like GPS locations, for instance, or you know, true falses, like you know, or, you know, category would be like your car type. Right, you know, Boolean would be like, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know, something like the something, something else. Number would be like your GPS location. So that all that is is a function that takes a category, a set of numbers, some booleans, right, and then maps it out through some crazy function to a number. Okay, that's called regression. Okay, so types in, types out. That I just described what's called regression. You can think of classification. Well, you have Boolean classification, same sort of thing goes to Boolean. You have you know multiple classification, same sort of thing goes to um, uh, categorical, you have multi-class, or like if you're going to do multiple categories, you might be a set. Okay, there's a bunch of things like that. You could say, okay, well, I also have other information. For instance, I have the sequence of where the car was in the past, I have time series. So you can inject a sequence. That becomes, the encoder just means we're going to try to featureize it, that we're going to pass it through a model. We decode it, means we're going to turn it into the ultimate output type. Okay? That's the kind of the classic models that you would have, the traditional kind of old school types of models that you'd have. What you're doing here, whether it's tree-based models or neural nets, that's irrelevant, right? The point is this interface is a generic interface. But we can also do many other types of things, right? So for instance, image to category, right? That is just image classification, right? Image to a set, well, it could be a set of numbers that represents like a bounding box, okay? So like a bounding box is a set of points that describes like the outline of a shape, like where is a car on a road for autonomous driving. That could simply be an image to a, 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 a set. The whole world, if you are paying at all attention to what's going on in the, in the machine learning world right now, there's a tremendous excitement actually about generative AI. Generative AI is, 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 the, is what was previously not possible, but now is possible with very complicated functions inside of here. It's things like where you have a text where you could say, like, write an article on the, the reasons why to use, you know, declarative approaches to machine learning. And that would be your input text. And then what the model would output is a full-on article, right, be in beautiful written English that would, that would be the here. That, all that is is a text-to-text -text model. It's a text-to-text -text model where this happens to have 175 billion knobs, okay, to use OpenAI's, uh, you know, GTP3 uh, model, which is kind of the state of the art in terms of generative text models. Similarly, there's like uh, examples now over the last two or three months, which maybe you saw on Twitter, which is image generation, right? So things like these models called DALI or models called stable diffusion. And, and trust me, what's going to happen over the next two year is going to be absolutely mind boggling in this world. But in those models, you say like, you know, draw me a picture, you know, in the style of Pixar 3D animated movie with a unicorn, you know, sitting on, you know, riding across a, you know, a, a, you know, a blue tinted you know, moon landscape, okay? What is that? That's text, okay? And then what do you have out of here? Well, you have an image coming out of here. So I don't know where I have it, right here, right? You have an image. So you're building a model that goes from text to image. And again, all that is is a function that goes from a text. The text gets encoded. That means it kind of gets turned into a set of numbers. It goes through a model. In these worlds, huge, massive, massive, massive nonlinear models that have been trained on an enormous, enormous amount of data with enormous amounts of compute, tens of, you know, $10 million in, of, of compute spend to generate these models because they're very hard. But what you're doing is you're seeing that, hey, that, that, that is the case. And this is going to be even, they're now going to be, they're going to be multiple modals. You can see ones that are doing, you know, audio and generating music and all the stuff from text. And you're going to see all these wild, wild examples like this. Um, the point here of this slide, though, is that all of these examples can be incorporated into a very simple abstraction, which is you have types coming in and you have types coming out. Okay? Um, and so what exactly goes on the inside, eh, maybe we can leave that to the system to figure that out, right? Maybe you don't have to say that. Maybe you say, hey, what are my inputs? What are my outputs, right? Um, maybe I have, you have some ground truth data, although what's wild about this new stuff is you don't even need ground truth for some of these use cases um, because they're pre-trained. 
Um, but for certainly, if you're doing arrival time, you need, to, you need to have ground truth data. Like That means like your historical information on what was the case. OK, so what I've just done here is I basically described to you a system where uh, you um, have uh, a set of uh, a, the ML task. OK, what's the, what's the remainder thing? And I actually would, I, I thought I had more time, so I was like going slow, but I actually, I actually took up time here. So, um, so what, we did the ML or AI task. The other thing, we've got to be operational, OK? So um, in many cases, like the arrival time, we have to refresh predictions. We have to refresh models itself. But I would say that's relatively easy to figure out declarative ways to describe, right? You can describe things like, well, in this case, this is a, this is a screenshot from the product that I'm working on, which is continual. And it's basically describing the training policies, which is how often do the models get refreshed, right? So think of just like a cron. How often are we retraining the models because they're kind of going stale? We're describing a promotion policy. That's governance, right? So what is the governance necessary for this? Is, are we in a world where you know, we're, really ra we're rapidly deploying models based on the, just the, the estimated performance? Or are we in a, maybe a regulated, re regulated domain where we need to put the model, the model manually and have it be manually audited by somebody, right? So that's just a policy around the model governance layer. We call that promotion. Promotion means moving a model from development to production. Um, and then we have a prediction po policy here, which in this case is batch prediction, right? Not real-time uh, inference. And so we're just saying, hey, we want to update this uh, daily. This might be a good set of policies for a churn model that you have for your business, for instance, right? Update it monthly, the model itself, you know, always take the latest model that you have and update the predictions for churn um, daily. So um, I'm just going to spend three minutes just, just highlighting a, you know, is this all just totally speculative nonsense, Tristan? Uh, or can you actually build this into a, a product? And so this is a little bit of the vendor pitch that, we're, that, that I have here. But um, so what is continual? Continual is basically our attempt to take this general idea of can we bring higher level abstractions uh, uh, and bring them to operational AI. Similar to the way uh, stream sets have brought higher level abstractions to just data ops in general, what we want to do is want to think about, hey, for operational AI, can we, can we do a similar thing? And we basically have built it on these two fundamental principles, and a declarative abstraction to defining your model, and, de and some declarative uh, configuration around the policies around models. And we put those two things together, we basically think we end up with an operational machine learning system um, that uh, is radically, radically simpler, simple, simplified. We do this in, you know, we also have some other little bit of opinions. For instance, you got to take some bets on where the data lives. All the stuff in operational world lives on, 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 it breathes data, breathes data both from training perspective and from an inference perspective. So what we do is we build on top of the quote unquote modern data stack, which just is code word for your cloud data warehouse or your cloud data platform. We bet on SQL, right? So you define your features and your data inputs and those inputs and those outputs, we define that with SQL, okay? Because that's like how you as a business expert bring your knowledge about how to model my business. You do need to do that. We don't magically do that. You need to do that. We have a declarative workflow, which is basically what I described, um, you know, uh, in terms of we take this declarative approach that we think empowers your whole teams and make your whole team more productive. And we're operationally focused. So we fundamentally believe we're not just trying to build like an auto ML system that's not, that doesn't kind of think about the operational concerns. We want, to we want you to, in the end, to have continually improving predictive models that get better and better and better. Um, what does this look like? I'll actually skip these two slides. This is a configure, either we have a UI and a configuration, but what you're describing here is basically the inputs. This is the way you could define, here are some features about your customers. You give a little bit of metadata associated so we know what, what, what these features represent. Um, and this is using DBT, which is a syntax for, for people that are on DBT. You describe your prediction task, for instance, like what are you actually trying to predict, the churn rate, you know, how, and then some policy here around your, your, your performance. Don't worry about this JSON structure. This is for DBT users, which is a, transformation tool, this is what they like. Um, you end up with a kind of a conceptual model that looks like this. You have some features around customer activity, ending up as a customer churn. You know, kind of this is our, our data model that we've added for a very simple use case. Um, and then you just basically push that into the system. So with these two uh, kind of configuration files, which are declarative, and you can do in the UI if you want, um, you get a fully operational model, okay? So you get, a model that gets, when it gets pushed out, it goes through different processes, it profiles the data, trains the data, promotes it, predicts it. You get to maintain, you, you know, we try a whole bunch of different algorithms. So what happens inside that little box between inputs and outputs, we go and figure it out, right? That's automated machine learning. But we're not just automated machine learning, we're an operational system, right? So as time goes on, we're then maintaining it. So here is the model history and you're seeing the performance of the current model. Um, 
you're seeing the performance of the current model here, the training history, the prediction history, historical performance, a whole bunch of, uh, a bunch of stuff. The beauty is from a declarative specification, right, you can then build more and more and more and more functionality that you kind of get for free. Um, mm, my slides are, do they go around in a circle? Um, that was basically, I think I had one more slide here, I guess. So, um, uh, so let me just conclude on this, which is basically um, the purpose. Of the, the, the point of this talk is really, I think, to let's be a little bit more ambitious about uh, simplifying data operations, machine learning, analytics. Um, let's look for higher level ab abstractions. I think it's extremely powerful if, you can, if we can find them and if you can find them for your team. Um, with ML, that could be continual. With data ops, it could be stream sets. With uh, you know analytics, it might be you know favor SQL over you know MapReduce or maybe Spark <laughs> Spark. Uh, Python, uh, if you can. Um, and what do you get? You get like empowering your whole data team. It reduces the operational burden overall, uh, and it ultimately accelerates uh, business impact, which is kind of the, kind of the key goal. Um, so let me conclude with that. Uh, thanks. If there's questions conceptually, happy to take questions. Also, just happy to chat with people afterwards if, if there's things that are interesting.